All right, so today I want to talk about uh, telescopes. Since we've been talking about the tools of astronomy uh, conceptually, I want to talk a little bit about the actual physical tools that astronomers use. And one of the earliest tools and tools that we still use today is the telescope, a regular old optical telescope that uses visible light. Um, so I want to talk about the different types of telescopes um, and talk about um, some of the uh, examples uh, throughout history and currently of telescopes that uh, are in use. And I'll do a little show and tell here in the lab some of the telescopes we have here at RBC. Um, let's see. So Galileo was one of the first people to take a telescope and point it at the sky. He didn't invent the telescope exactly, um, but he was one of the first people to make careful observations of the moon and and planets with a telescope. Uh, he actually read a book about how telescopes were made. Telescopes at the time were used by, you know, sailors uh, to sight land and to look for other ships and stuff. So um, he had heard about, about telescopes. He read about how to make lenses and he made his own uh, in 1609. And he observed sunspots on the sun and craters on the moon and the moons of Jupiter and all the stuff we talked about in the first week of class. Um, Galileo's telescope was a type of telescope called a refractor using lenses to make an image. And you can buy a telescope that's as good as Galileo's telescope for a hundred bucks today on Amazon. It was not particularly powerful and you don't need a particularly powerful telescope um, to see the things that Galileo saw. Um, a refracting telescope uses a lens to focus light and create an image. So there is a lens, a, a convex lens, a, a lens that, um, that focuses light like a magnifying glass at the objective end of the telescope, the part that you point at the sky. Uh, and that focuses the light to a point and creates an image. And then there's a second lens at the other end of the telescope if it's built for a person to look through. Um, and that lens magnifies the image. So in a typical telescope, you can change out the lens that you look through with your eye uh, to change the magnification of the telescope. The magnification is determined by um, the ratio of the, the focal length of this lens to this lens. So you can change the lens and change the focal length. Refracting telescopes were the first kind of telescopes and they're still a very popular kind of telescope for amateurs um, who might just wanna look at nebulas and galaxies and uh, planets in their backyard. Uh, there are some limitations to uh, a reflecting telescope though. This is, uh, an observatory in Wisconsin that houses one of the largest uh, refractors ever made, which is a 40 inch uh, refractor. And when you talk about the size of a telescope, you're talking about the diameter of it, not the length of it. Um, so the 40 inch uh, refractor at Yerkes Observatory has uh, a 40 inch objective lens. So um, 40 inches is a little bigger than a meter, right? So uh, about yay big. It doesn't really seem that big. Uh, when you think about the large telescopes and you might have seen uh, and observatories and such, uh, here's a picture of the Yerkes uh, refractor from uh, around the time it was built and the time uh, picture of it taken today. It's actually still functioning and still in use. Um, refractors tend to have a long focal length. They tend to require a long tube for a given, um, for a given size of the lens. And um, the limiting factor of the size of a refractor that you can build has to do with the properties of that big lens. Imagine building a 40 inch lens, a lens 40 inches in diameter. What does the property of that have to be? Well, it has to be perfectly clear and not have any distortions or bubbles or whatever in the glass. And also it gets pretty thick. Imagine making a piece of glass this big around and this thick with no imperfections or bubbles or waviness or at all inside the glass um, is very difficult to manufacture. The other thing is that a, a magnifying lens, a concave lens is thick in the middle and thin on the edge, but the edge has to support the whole weight of the lens when you're pointing it up. So when this refractor is pointing up to the sky, you've got all this glass, hundreds of pounds of glass pushing on the edge and that can actually distort the glass, which distorts the image because it changes the focus, or it can just make it impossible to build a piece of glass um, that big, strong enough to support its own weight. So 
there aren't really any refracting telescopes with a lens much bigger than a meter. There are no four foot, five foot, six foot, 20 foot refracting telescopes because we couldn't build a 20 foot lens with good optical clarity that could support its own weight. It's simply not possible given the physical properties of glass. So this places practical limitations on how big of a refracting telescope we can make. It was Isaac Newton back in the late 16, oh, he published optics in 1700, more or less, 1699. So it was probably around the 1680s that he was working on the idea of a different kind of telescope. And this is called a reflecting telescope or a Newtonian telescope in this case. And a Newtonian reflecting telescope uses a mirror instead of a lens to focus light to gather light and to create that image that you then magnify with an eyepiece. The advantage of using a mirror instead of a lens is that the light doesn't have to go through a mirror, it just bounces off the front. So a mirror can be as thick as you want in order to, uh, to make the mirror as big as you want. Uh, so the way that the path of light works in a reflecting telescope, a reflecting telescope is open in the front and completely closed in the back. The mirror is in the back of the telescope. So the light comes into the tube, it hits the mirror, and the light is focused to a point. Um, if you want an example of this kind of mirror, uh, you might have uh, in your house or in your bathroom, uh, uh, a magnifying mirror, like a makeup mirror uh, that has a concave surface that actually magnifies the image if you look at your reflection in that concave mirror. So the light is focused by the concave mirror to a point inside the tube. And the problem with that is you can't see that image because it's inside the tube. You need to get that light outside the tube so that you can magnify it and look at it with your eye or look at it with a camera or whatever you're connecting to the telescope. And the way you do that is to put a second mirror inside the tube that bounces the light out the side of the tube. And then you put your eyepiece out here, okay? So a Newtonian reflector has a primary mirror that's curved that focuses the light and then a secondary mirror and all that secondary mirror does is bounce the light to the side so we can put an eyepiece on the side of the telescope in order to look at. So in a Newtonian telescope, you actually look through the side of the tube near the end in order to see the image. And we put an eyepiece there to magnify the image just like in a refracting telescope. So we can change the magnification uh, as needed. The weird thing about the secondary mirror in a Newtonian telescope is it actually blocks a little bit of the light getting to the primary curved mirror. Um, but that's just a design factor that you have to deal with. You might think, won't you, when you look through the telescope, won't you see that secondary mirror blocking the light? And the answer is no, because the primary mirror takes all the light from around the secondary mirror and focuses it to a point. So you're kind of seeing around it because of the way the primary mirror focuses the light. There's another way to do a reflecting telescope, which is to put a hole in the primary mirror and to make the secondary mirror just bounce the light back through the hole. So you look through the back of the telescope, just like a uh, refracting telescope. So the mirror focuses the light, the secondary mirror bounces it back and it goes through a hole in the side. There's an advantage to this design, which is that you can make your whole telescope half as long because the light goes back and forth. Um, the disadvantage is that the secondary mirror blocks some of your primary mirrors, so you have to make it a little bit bigger. So um, this kind of reflecting telescope tends to be big in diameter and short in length. Um, and we'll see a couple examples of that. This design is called a Schmidt design. Um, named after another optician in the, I don't know when Schmidt did his thing, eight, eight, probably 1800s. Um, here's an example of uh, a modern telescope. I don't know which observatory this is. This isn't the Keck. Um, it might be the one in South America, which is called the VLT for Very Large Telescope. Um, when you look at the primary mirror on this telescope, you can see that it is made of separate hexagons of glass. And that's because it's very hard to make a single mirror that is 10 feet, 12 feet, 20 feet across. It's 
but you can make it in chunks. You can't make a lens in chunks because the light has to go through that lens and the places where the pieces go together, you'll get all sorts of um, reflections and distortions and craziness. But because the light doesn't go through a mirror, it bounces off the front. Um, you don't have to worry about those sorts of distortions. By the way, I should mention that the mirrors that telescopes are made of are a little bit different than the mirrors in your house, like your bathroom mirror. Your bathroom mirror is a piece of glass and behind that piece of glass is something shiny, uh, uh, usually a, a film of uh, aluminum or, or whatever applied to the back of the glass. So when you look at a mirror in your house, the light is going through the glass bounces off the shiny back of the glass, then goes through the glass again. So when you look at a bathroom mirror, the light has actually gone through the glass twice. Telescope mirrors are not like that. Astronomical telescope mirrors are what's called front surface mirrors. The reflective coating is not on the back of the glass, it's on the front of the glass, okay? Meaning the light never goes through the glass in an astronomical telescope. It bounces off a reflective coating on the front and is focused to make an image. That means the optical qualities of the glass do not matter at all. All that matters is that the surface has got the right shape. And that shape is either curved in the shape of a sphere or a parabola, which is the shape that focuses light to a perfect focus point. Um, that means that it's much easier to make a great big mirror because the inside of the glass doesn't matter. It's only the front surface of the glass that has to have the right shape. Here's an example of something called a schmidt cassegrain uh, telescope, which we'll all look at a real one in a second. So I'm just gonna skip over this real quick. Um, one of the features that we're used to seeing when we look at pictures of space is we see a star and the star has these four spikes that, that go out from the star. Um, and sometimes there'll be a ring around uh, the image of the star too. That is not a property of stars. That is not a property of light. That is a property of the telescopes that we generally use to take pictures of space, which tend to be reflecting telescopes. And those, that cross that you see when you look at an image of a bright star in an image of space is um, diffraction spikes caused by the support that hold that secondary mirror in place inside the reflecting telescope. Here's a picture of a reflecting telescope. You can't see the mirror because the mirror is at the back, but what you can see is the secondary mirror, which is being held here. You can see that it's an angle and it's being held by these four struts. And when the light hits those four struts, it kind of bends around it, creating this cross-shaped pattern of light that in the long exposure photograph shows up as these crosses. So these uh, diffraction spikes are part of our kind of mental image of what a picture of a star looks like through a telescope. And they're a distortion effect caused by, um, caused by the, uh, the supports of the secondary mirror in a reflecting telescope. One of the most famous examples of reflecting telescope is the Hubble Space Telescope, which was launched in 1990, way back when I was uh, taking the class that you are taking now, uh, taking astronomy in college. The uh, primary mirror of the Hubble Space Telescope is almost eight feet in diameter. The Hubble Space Telescope, the comparison that people often use is about the size of a school bus. Um, powered by solar panels, radio transmitters to communicate back to the earth, uh, a hatch that can open and close. So um, when it's not in use, it can uh, keep space debris and micrometeorites from hitting the mirror. And the primary mirror is in the back of the Hubble. One thing that the Hubble Space Telescope does not need is a primary mirror to bounce the light to the side so somebody can put their eyeball up to it and look through it. Nobody looks through the Hubble Space Telescope. The Hubble Space Telescope has cameras located inside the tube where the light from the primary mirror is focused. So if you've just got a reflecting telescope that's a camera, you don't need that secondary mirror to bounce the light out, but you do need to put your cameras or your light detectors um, at that point where the secondary mirror, that focal point where the light is focused together. So um, the instruments that actually detect the light are inside the tube of the telescope. There's another picture of the Hubble in orbit. Um, the Hubble's in fairly low Earth orbit. Do I have a stat here that says how high it orbits? I think it's about 600 miles above the Earth, higher than the International Space Station, but uh, you can see that it's not terribly far away from the Earth. It's not out, in, not out where the moon is. It's just in fairly uh, 
lowish Earth orbit. The successor to the Hubble Space Telescope is a space telescope called the James Webb Space Telescope. You can see here a photograph of the primary mirror of the James Webb while it's still in its clean room laboratory being built. You can see that the James Webb has got a diameter of, I mean, here's a couple dudes standing here who look about you know, five something. So that's at least 10 feet across, maybe 12 feet across. I don't know the exact number off the top of my head, uh, but larger than the Hubble. You also see when you look at the mirror, this gold color of the, the reflective coating on the mirror, that is to reflect infrared light. Um, the James Webb will be able to see infrared wavelengths that the Hubble Space Telescope cannot, which is an interesting difference between the capabilities of the Hubble and the James Webb. The James Webb has been delayed and delayed and delayed and has not been launched yet. And one of the assignments I usually give this class around this time, and I will post it to Canvas um, today, this afternoon, is to do a little research, answer a couple questions about the James Webb and give me a status update. When's it gonna be launched? Um, and uh, how much does it cost? And that's one of the issues that's been plaguing the James Webb has been uh, cost overruns. It's costing more than they expected it to cost. So I'll post those questions up to Canvas later today. Um, one thing to think about when you're doing uh, astronomy with visible light from the Earth, the reason we have space telescopes is because if you're down here on the ground, you have to look through the atmosphere and looking through the atmosphere introduces all kinds of distortion uh, and scattering into the light. Uh, so when you do do astronomy from the ground, you wanna do it as high up as possible. You wanna do it on the top of a mountain so there's less atmosphere between you and the stuff you're trying to look at in space. When you're doing astronomy from the ground, the atmosphere is your enemy. So you'll notice that a lot of astronomy, uh, astronomical observatories, visible light observatories, are located uh, on mountaintops. Also places where there's low humidity. So a lot of them are in deserts. Like there's a famous observatory near Flagstaff, Arizona. There's a famous observatory down near uh, in Chile. Um, there's an observatory on Mount Akea, which is a mountain in Hawaii. So uh, observatories tend to be places that are remote, preferably dry. Uh, and as high altitude as possible. In fact, you can see this one here is actually above the clouds uh, and its current location so that we're not, uh, we don't have to worry about the weather all the time when we wanna look at the space. Um, <clears throat> really quickly to talk about radio telescopes because that's the other kind of telescope you can build on the ground. Um, they use a parabolic reflector, just like a parabolic mirror in a reflecting telescope. So a radio telescope is a reflecting telescope that bounces radio waves instead of visible light. And they reflect those light uh, radio waves into an uh, antenna or just a detector. That detector is held in front of the telescope, usually by three or four large struts, sometimes one big large strut. Um, and uh, that antenna picks up the radio waves and, and that's how radio telescopes work. You might have yourself um, a miniature radio telescope on top of your house. Uh, if you've got a direct TV or dish TV dish, um, it's a parabolic reflector that captures radio waves that are transmitted on the earth that carry TV signals. And the parabolic reflector reflects them to this detector and that picks up the signal. Um, you can actually, if you have, if you're electronics whiz and have the right equipment, you can turn a direct TV dish into a little radio telescope. You can use it to observe the radio emissions of Jupiter's atmosphere and stuff like that. You just have to connect it to the right kind of equipment. Uh, one of the most famous radio telescopes in the world, the largest radio telescope for a very long time was the Arecibo radio telescope in Puerto Rico. Um, it's so large that it can't even be pointed to different locations in the sky. It's just a big hole in the ground that they put a radio telescope in. So it just ha looks at whatever happens to go above the radio telescope in the course of the night. Um, you can see the parabolic dish in the ground and then the uh, receiver is supported by these three towers. Um, Arecibo was damaged uh, by Hurricane Maria in 2017. Uh, this is a picture of it shortly after the damage and eventually the cables holding up the detector broke and that detector came crashing down uh, and uh, 
Arecibo is now completely out of commission um, and probably will not be rebuilt. Um, they're building a larger uh, version of Arecibo, I think in China, um, to be the new biggest radio telescope in the world. Another way to build a big radio telescope is by a technique called interferometry. And I don't want to get into the nitty gritty details of interferometry and how it works, but to make it really, really simple, you can take the signals of two radio telescopes and combine them together. And it's almost like you had a radio telescope as big as the two of them put together. Uh, and if you put them farther apart and you combine their signals together, it's almost like having a radio telescope as big as the whole their whole uh, separation. So uh, this is a, um, a radio telescope uh, facility called the VLA or Very Large Array, which consists of dozens of telescopes. You can actually, maybe you can't see in here, uh, some of them are on like railroad tracks. They can actually be moved further apart and closer together. And this array of radio telescopes functions almost as if it was a dish this big, as big as the whole field out here that the radio telescopes are located in. So rather than building one giant radio telescope, we build a bunch of smaller ones and we combine their signals together electronically. And it's like having a radio telescope that's as big as all of them put together. There are some plans for what's called very long baseline interferometry or VLBI, where we would combine the signals from a radio telescope on earth with a radio telescope on the moon or a radio telescope in orbit around the earth and the moon. And that would be like having a radio telescope that was thousands of miles across. Um, this obviously hasn't happened yet. We don't have a radio telescope in the moon uh, or in orbit, but it's something we're thinking about doing uh, in the future. So VLBI, very long baseline interferometry would be a way to create a pseudo telescope uh, that was as large as the moon's orbit. This week's lab is going to be to build two virtual telescopes in a optics simulator sandbox um, where you can make light beams and you can make lenses and you can make mirrors and put them all together. Um, and so I will post a video explaining how to do that on Friday and I'll post the activity on Friday. Really straightforward. Make a reflector, take a screenshot, make a refractor, take a screenshot, submit them, uh, maybe answer a couple of questions. Let me stop the share and go back to my camera here. I've got, got myself on a mobile camera here today so I can move it around some. Um, and I want to show off some of the toys we have in the lab. Uh, some of these belong to me. Some of these belong to Richard Bland College. Uh, some of them have a story behind them. But we've got a bunch of telescopes. So let's first look at this little refractor. This is the kind of little refractor that you used to be able to buy from Toys R Us for 120 bucks. Um, it's probably about as powerful as Galileo's refractor. You can see that in this end of the telescope, there is a lens. Take this. This is just a cover to keep light from getting to the side of the lens. There's a lens here at this end of the telescope that you point up at space, and there is a eyepiece down at this end of the telescope that you look through. Um, the telescope is on a mount with slow motion control, so you can move it slowly to follow things as they move across the sky. One of the issues with looking at stuff in the sky at night is that the Earth rotates and everything in the sky is always appearing to move uh, across the sky around the North Star as the Earth rotates, which means you can't just look at something in the sky. You've got to constantly move your telescope to follow it across the sky as the Earth rotates. Uh, and you can do that manually. This telescope does it manually. I'll show you the other telescopes that do it electronically. Another thing that you'll see, a feature you'll see on many telescopes is this little tiny telescope on the side, which is like a, uh, it's called a finder scope. Uh, it's a low magnification telescope and you, you set it up so that whatever this telescope is looking at, this telescope is looking at. So if you want to look at something in the sky, you find it in the finder scope first. It's got little crosshairs in it, like a rifle sight. Um, and then you, if you've got it set up properly, when you look through the big telescope, uh, you'll be able to see it there. Uh, the, uh, the eyepieces here are uh, removable. I don't know why this is covered in tape. Uh, I think I've got an eyepiece here that doesn't really fit this tube, so I have it taped so it doesn't fall out. Um, but the eyepieces are removable. Uh, if you look at the eyepiece, it tells the focal length. This is a 25 millimeter uh, eyepiece, so you can change the eyepiece depending on what you happen to want to be looking at. Um, so that's a small refracting telescope. Um, 
has a diameter, the diameter of the objective lens is 60 millimeters. So we call this a 60 millimeter refractor. One of the other telescopes we have here, try not to talk too much when I'm far away from the This is my telescope. It belongs to me, not to Richard Blay and College. This is an eight inch reflecting telescope. It's a Newtonian uh, reflector. So let me get a little further away from the camera. Uh, it's got a sign on it from the last observing session. Last observing session I had, we were looking at a transit of Mercury. Mercury was passing in front of the sun a couple of years ago. Um, the Tube is eight inches in diameter, which means the primary mirror is eight inches in diameter. Let's see if I can just take the camera and look down the tube. So you can see down there at the end of the tube is a mirror. Okay, in fact, you can actually see the reflection of the camera there in the mirror. You can also see that right here is the secondary mirror and it's supported by those four, um, those four, uh, struts that give you that cross-shaped uh, appearance of stars. So the light goes down, it hits the primary mirror, it's focused to the secondary mirror where it bounces off, and here you can kind of see how that secondary mirror is tilted, and that bounces the light out the side. And you can see if I look in the where the eyepiece goes and I put my hand in front of the telescope, you can see how the light comes from the end bounces, it's hard for me to hold that all in one place, bounces through, you can see how it comes. And this has no eyepiece in it right now. I can put an eyepiece in here and I can magnify it uh, however much I want it. The advantage of this telescope over the last telescope is not just that it's bigger, longer. Okay? The magnification uh, as a function of the focal length, how long the telescope is and what eyepiece you put in it. But the more important thing about this telescope is that it's bigger in diameter. When you're looking at things in space, you're often looking at things that are really dim. Nebulas, these clouds of hydrogen gas that are glowing, galaxies that are billions of light years away. So in astronomy, usually it's not as much of a concern that you want to magnify the image as you want to gather as much light as possible. So the bigger the diameter of your telescope, the more light you're gathering and the dimmer thing you're looking at. That's why it's better that the James Webb telescope is bigger than the Hubble Space Telescope because it gathers more light, which means it can see things that are dimmer, which means it can see things that are further away. So uh, a 10 inch telescope is bigger than this eight inch telescope and a 12 inch telescope is better than that. Over here we have, let me see how close I can get to it with my computer. A much larger telescope, which has a diameter of 14 inches. And this is an example of the schmidt cassegrain design. It's a hybrid between a reflector and a refractor. If I take the lens cap off, it's all hard to do with one hand. I gotta put the camera down for a second, hold on. There we go, take the lens cap off. We can see that in the front, there's some kind of piece of glass which we'll talk about in a second. But in the back, there is a mirror, just like a reflector. And here in the middle is where the secondary mirror is. So if you, if you see there, you can actually see uh, out the back of the mirror. You can see this yellow lens cap. Okay. Now, there's something else going on here, which is that I've got this little right angle thing in here just to make it easier when you're outside so you don't have to get down on your knees. You can look through the eyepiece down instead of horizontally. Uh, let me put this over here. So you look through this telescope from, let me back up. You look through this telescope from the back. You look through it from back here. So the light comes in here, hits the primary mirror, bounces up, hits the secondary mirror, bounces back, comes through this hole, and this hole is where you put your eyepiece, and that's where you look through. So this telescope, you notice, is much, much shorter. Even though it has a bigger diameter, it's much, much shorter than my, uh, my eight-inch Newtonian 
uh, reflector. And the reason is because the optical path is folded in half. The light comes here, it hits the secondary mirror, it comes back here. So the tube only has to be half as long as if it was a Newtonian uh, uh, reflector. The other difference is this, this glass front, which is actually a lens. Um, and so this kind of telescope uses a combination of mirrors and lenses. Let me see if I can explain why that is. If you want to take light and you want to focus it to a precise point, your mirror has to have a shape called a parabola. You guys probably know what a parabola is from some algebra class, right? It's a, uh, the graph is y equals x squared, or y equals something times x squared. And one of the properties of parabola is it will focus light to a point. Well, it's harder to make a parabola in a two-dimensional piece of glass than it is just to make a circle. You can make a mirror that is just spherical, round, that will kind of focus light to a point. If you've got a curved uh, makeup mirror or uh, a bathroom mirror, uh, it's probably not a parabola. It's probably just spherical. There is a way to make a lens to put in front of a spherical mirror to correct for the fact that it's not a parabola. Uh, and that kind of telescope is called a Cassegrainian telescope. Uh, so this is called a Schmidt Cassegrainian telescope. Uh, Schmidt because it uses the double uh, uh, kind of folded in half shape with the light coming out the back uh, and Cassegrain because it uses the, uh, the corrective lens. Or maybe I've got that backwards. Maybe the Cassegrain is the light going back and forth and the Schmidt is the corrective lens. Suffice it to say, the schmidt cassegrainian design is a really efficient way to make a big, powerful telescope for cheap. If this had a spherical mirror, it would be more, or sorry, if this had a parabolic mirror, it would be more expensive to make the mirror. It's cheaper to make this lens that corrects for the spherical mirror than it is to make the parabolic mirror. So um, you can make a telescope like this for $4,000 instead of $10,000. I'll tell you a story about this telescope really, really quick. When I was uh, in graduate school at William & Mary, uh, which is where I got my degree, I was the TA for the astronomy class because I kind of already had some experience with telescopes. I grew up messing around with telescopes. Um, and there was an observatory on the roof of Small Hall at William & Mary, the science building, the physics building. And we would take students up there and they had to look at different stuff over the course of the semester. They had to look at uh, Jupiter's moons and they had to look at the moon and whatever. So um, I did that, I don't know, when I was in graduate school, which would have been from 1993, 1994 or so. Um, fast forward more than 20 years, a couple of years ago, uh, I went back to William & Mary to visit my, uh, my PhD advisor, uh, Dr. Mark Scher, who still teaches there. Uh, he was a fairly young professor when he was my PhD advisor, so he's still teaching at William and Mary. And I just went back over to William and Mary to have lunch in the chat. And um, their science building was remodeled extensively about seven, eight years ago. Uh, so it's barely recognizable from the time I was there. And we were talking about it. And he said that they also remodeled the observatory. I said, oh, that's cool. Do they still have the same telescope or did they get a new telescope? And he said, oh, they got a new telescope. And I said, oh. What did they do with the old telescope? And he said, I don't know, I think it's in a closet in the basement. And I said, uh, can we have it? Like, can Richard Bland have the old telescope? Uh, and he said, I don't see why not, just send an email to the department chair. So I did that. And the department chair said, I don't see why not. Richard Bland and William and Mary are kind of the same school or at least they're connected to one another. Um, so I went and I got the telescope for free. Um, which is probably, you know, $8,000 worth of optics. Um, I bought this new mount for it. Oh, I thought I was gonna tell you about the mounts. So this mount uh, to this telescope is actually motorized. So when you go outside at night and you point it at what you want in the sky, you just turn it on and it automatically rotates to follow uh, objects across the sky. It's connected to a motor that spins once every 24 hours. So um, when you're looking at the sky, all you have to do is uh, point it. It also has this little computer control doohickey that if I want to look at the Nebula M42, I just go to Nebula or go to the Messier catalog M42 and 
it, like it automatically points itself uh, at what I want to point. I want to look at Jupiter. I just go to planets, Jupiter, and key it in. And its computer knows where Jupiter is, uh, and so it can just point itself at Jupiter every night. So uh, using telescopes is much easier now than it used to be because they have got built-in computers and are smart enough to know where everything is. You used to have to know where everything was yourself in order to point the telescope at the right place. Anyway, I bought a new mount for it. So William and Mary basically got this, or RBC basically got this free uh, giant telescope um, from William and Mary, just because I happened to be at the right place at the right time before somebody in William and Mary threw it away, which was probably what was eventually going to happen. Um, we've also got this little baby version of that same telescope. Uh, it's a Schmidt Cassegrainian telescope. It's got the same onboard computer control. So I can take this out. Uh, it's a heck of a lot easier to move than the other one. Uh, I can take this out when we're doing a small observing session. It is a Schmidt Cassegrainian design, just like the other one. But instead of being 14 inches in diameter, it's only six inches in diameter. You can see the same situation. The mirror in the back focuses light to the secondary mirror, which then bounces the light back through the back of the telescope. So. If we were all here together on campus, we would pick a couple nights of the semester to go outside and look at Jupiter and look at the moon. But unfortunately, um, because of the course is online, we don't have the opportunity to do that. But I did think it was important for you to see a couple of real honest to goodness telescopes to see what they look like um, and to prepare you for the lab activity on Friday. So on Friday, I will post a video, a short video, um, it will either be in Zoom or YouTube, but I'll, I'll post the, uh, the assignment where it is. So look for a lab assignment to show up on Friday where you build virtual telescopes in a kind of optics sandbox in your web browser. And, um, and that'll be the lab activity for this week. So that gets us, I think, all the way through this topic of what are some of the tools available for astronomers. And then next week, we can jump right into the solar system and start talking one at a time about the planets in our solar system and their moons. Um, and that'll take about two weeks, I think, for us to get from Mercury out to the Kuiper belt and, uh, and then start talking about the sun and stars. So um, that is where we are headed.